Hi, John McGrady here in my interview with the Statistician Series, and today it's an honor and a privilege to have Dr. Rafael Irizarry, aka Rafa, who is a professor in the Department of Biostatistics here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School. Rafa did his education, he did his undergrad degree at the University of Puerto Rico, and then went on to do a graduate fellowship and a PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, in the Department of Biostatistics, working under David Brillinger. And he's been very active, his career here at Hopkins has gone down many routes, but recently he's been very active in the field of statistical genomics, and so we're going to talk to him about that and some of his thoughts on the future of biostatistics in general. So, Rafa, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you here. So, so as I noted before, you've been very active uh, in, in, for a while now at the interface of biology and statistics, you know, in the genomics, et cetera. I was wondering if you could comment on one or two major discoveries uh, in genomic science that have been aided and abetted by statistics. Okay, so uh, genomics is a very broad term, I should say, first Fair enough, yeah, I should probably... Oh, no, it's fine. I, it's used by, in the statistics community, it's used to the single genomics, but the, the, the actual sub substantive field is very uh, varied and, and large. There's very different different kinds of, of biology that use it, different kind of applications of technology. But there is, there's some, there's a commonality, and it's that in, somewhere in the 90s, uh, there was a revolution in technology, maybe earlier, where biologists went from measuring uh, single outputs and in a way that you really didn't need statisticians because the data was, was simple enough that you could just look at it and understand it. They, they all of a sudden, with, with this very quick change in technology, now all of a sudden they were getting massive, um, massive data sets that were hard to interpret, that were noisy. So when this happens, you have a whole field that all of a sudden needs statisticians. And it's many of them, right? They're, they're using these technologies for many different things, uh, but they all, are, are, they, are, they all have a similarity in that they all need somebody to help them, they all have massive data sets, they all have these new technologies that aren't that well understood yet, mm -hmm. and a lot of them had problems, systematic noise, and measurement unwanted error, measurement, all that stuff, confounding. which needed to be dealt with. So um, th there has been some success stories in genomics, it's still a pretty young field, but we do have some, some clinical applications already. Uh, and the, the general idea, one of the general ideas, one, or one of the, the the um, contributions that people working in genomics want to do is, is to try to make the, the diagnostics and, and treatment somewhat more personalized, right? So mm -hmm. they want they want to maybe sub, find subgroups of people that each one will get a different treatment or, or a different diagnostics based on molecular measurements. That's kind of a very general way of describing what a, su a subgroup of them wants to do. There's already a couple of of, of um, commercialized products that, that are based on this. So this is the uh, idea of personalized medicine? Or yeah, well, so that's one of the, yeah, exactly. That's, that's the, this, this term, this, this catchphrase of, of personalized medicine, that's kind of what it, what it means. Like, so you can imagine a drug that will work for some people that you're not, the clinical trial doesn't tell you which group it is. But there might be something, some molecular outcome that you can, you know, you can measure um, with these new technologies that can tell you which of these subgroups you're in and then give you the correct treatment. That's the idea. So I would say that, that, that perhaps the biggest contribution of, of statistics has been that, that, that as soon as, as it would realize that it was statistics data analysis that, that was needed here, then all these people started using So everybody uses some statistics. Everybody who's doing this at some level, they use statistics. And there's, there's one a specific example that, that I have been involved with, which is the Bioconductor Project, which is a, pro, a, 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 it's a project that puts together software created by, by many different people. It's a very bottom-up um, project where a lot of people contribute. It's open development, not just open source. And, and, and this, this piece of software, or this, this suite of, 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 soft, of different programs and Algorithms is something that a lot of biologists use. It's one of the most used pieces of software for the analysis of microarrays, for example. Uh, I think that there was a survey conducted by one of the big manufacturers of technologies, and when they asked people, biologists, what what analysis tools do you use, how what to analyze your data, uh, the number one 
piece of software was Excel, of course. Mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. uses Excel. But number two was Bioconductor. So it's it's widely used. Widely used. And I, you know you, you can you can think of it that way. Instead of giving a specific example of a method, you can just think that the fact that the biologists are using R and Bioconductor is a big contribution, not just from not just from the the, the creators of Bioconductor, but for all everybody who contributes. Contributes to it, it. a very big group of people. And so Bioconductor consists. I mean, if I uh, my in my uh, simple explanation, but it consists of a series of packages written by biologists and statisticians that address some of the statistical needs of people working in the field of genomics. Yeah, so mm -hmm. there's a core group that, that tries to maintain an infrastructure and a, and a way to filter good packages mm -hmm. or, or at least keep, keep, do some quality control. Uh, but other than that, it, it's, you know, anybody can contribute and we have hundreds of packages right now contributed by dozens of different people. Very cool. Yeah. So Rafa is actually the third link in the uh, Simply Statistics blog. We've already talked to Jeff and Roger, and you know, he's uh, uh, the uh, the ultimate uh, you know editor here. So uh, you know Rafa, like both in the context of biology and genomics, and also in general. I mean, as you probably have your finger on the pulse of statistics and biostatistics, what you know, what are some challenges, uh, exciting opportunities, and challenges for statisticians as we uh, move forward? You know, in the next few years, when does anything come to the top of your head? Well, well yeah, I mean, that, it's it's in a, it's in a, a great time to be a statistician right now. Uh, there's just like it happened with biology. It's not the only field where this happened. All of a sudden, data arrived as, as a, <laughs> a, a as as a way to to discover new science. There's this has happened in. And, you know, you can see it in baseball. You can watch the movie Moneyball. Moneyball. <laughs> um, it happened with the, with the polling, you, the, Nate, the Nate Silver story, and there's others as well. We actually talk about this in the blog. In, in Netflix, right, it uses data to predict what movies you like. Uh, Target tries to predict what products you should be marketed using right. data. And, I mean, there's examples, and more and more examples of this that, that we, can, we can list. So that there's been a fundamental change in the last 30 years where all of a sudden there's there's massive amount of data available and can be created to answer specific questions be it in, in science or marketing or finance uh, and that has it has created a new uh, a whole new set of challenges I mean I'm mm -hmm. not going to name them all but each one of these new data sets and questions um, you know opens up new challenges that I think statisticians are in a very good position to participate in, in, in answering. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's not, I don't, I don't actually want to give you specific examples because it's just, it's a, just a complete such a, change okay. of, of a paradigm shift a in paradigm terms of, shift, I think, yeah, from, from, from maybe hypothesis driven science to data driven discovery, discovery, discovery driven and science. And also in other, in other fields too, where, where you went from experts trying to make decisions to data driven decisions. As you know, the examples that we gave, like Netflix, Target, mm -hmm. using and, and, and baseball, etc. So that's a great time to be a statistician, and 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 you can see that that um, new new methods will be needed. But you, you can also do a lot with the methods that exist. They exist, yeah. Been a, there was a whole period of time, you know, from the 30s to the 60s, where where there was a lot of innovation in terms of method development. And you know, we can name a bunch of methods, and you probably teach a lot of these in your class. Uh, and those methods were w w are very powerful and can be used today. I mean, I, I think that at some point it, it kind of worked out great because at, at some point there was a little bit of stagnation in, in, in method innovation towards the 80s where, you know, st the, the number of methodology that started, st started stagnating a little bit, the innovation. But then all of a sudden now you have all this data that you can use all these tools that were developed in that period to answer questions. And I, I imagine that going forward, new methods will, will be needed and they'll, they'll, they'll arise from these new challenges and questions. Well, it's actually interesting to hear you say that, actually. So, you, you know, I'm always telling people in the introductory classes that really, you know, this is, these are the fundamental building blocks on which a lot of statistics is done. And a box plot is useful uh -huh. when you're looking at, uh, you know, a simple data set and a complex data set, et cetera, and a lot of the regression models that we I, talk I gotta about. Say, I, I think I use a box plot in every single data analysis I do. Excellent. Even so, so you hear that? That's, like, I mean, these as fancy as the questions I asked and the data and the expensive, you know, you have a $2 million data set. You still got to look many at what's times going on. I, I start off with a box plot histograms, a scatter plots. <laughs> Excellent. And then, you know, when you get into dealing with like, you know, when you're doing uh, associations in genomics and you have confounding by batch effects, et cetera, it's, it's just 
the basic linear models, right? Mm -hmm. like, and sometimes extensions thereof, given the structure of the data. And then certainly a lot of the prediction that's being done by you know Target and Google and uh, Netflix and in the realm of personalized medicine or the attempt is done through uh, expanding regression models, right? Ex ex prediction models, Pre yeah, existing prediction models. A lot of the, the winners are combinations of, of, of previous methods, not necessarily new ones. So what we're doing in these classes is really fundamental to the next steps. Absolutely, yeah. And I would say also understanding, one, one of the advantages that we have as statisticians is understanding variability very well and understanding chance and how chance, yeah. chance can fool you. Uh, you. That is a common problem you see in genomics, that you see people being fooled by chance. It's very common. You see a pattern, it looks real, but you don't really understand. It's, it's, it's counterintuitive that it's actually not real. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you need the mathematics, the statistics knowledge to 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 decipher that it actually is not. It's just it's just due to serendipitous. That is a that is a very important skill that we develop as statisticians. This skepticism that we have and 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 the the always checking it and checking to see if this could have just a ch happened by chance. So just measuring against the likelihood of it happening if nothing well, there's, going there's on. There's many ways of many doing ways it. Do it. Yeah. There's many ways of doing it, but the, the concept of of wondering the first the the just a natural tendency to wonder if it's true or not, if it's really uh, a real signal or just due to chance. Uh, it, that, that in itself is a big contribution you can make. And second, it, developing some kind of way of putting a number or somehow quantifying the, the possibility of it in due to chance, right? That's, you know, you can think of p-values and Bayesian approaches, posteriors, and who knows? I mean, there's a bunch of different, different ways, ways you can ways do, to it. do it. Different ways to do it, sure. The, it, you know, every problem will have a, a, a different best or, or what we think is the best solution. Uh, and um, uh, But I think it's the, the more important part is actually... Getting people to think in that framework. Think in that framework, yes, yes. Think in that framework and consider that possibility. Excellent. Well, thank you for taking the time to come sure, out today. It it's fun. been a pleasure to have you. And uh, I'm sure my, our listeners are thrilled to hear your take on this. And we'll, uh, again, put the link to Simply Statistics in the uh, comments section. There's a lot of good information there. Until next time.